such a thrill and folks who are listening and folks who are watching on YouTube, we've been giggling before I even hit record. It's a long time <laughs> friend. There he is. He's Tony Johnson. What's up, legend? Happy New Year. Uh, thanks, Mark. And to you and all the listeners. Yeah, it's a bit cold here in the UK, but, um, you know, we should have been out in SA, out in the Bundu, but all yeah. this COVID put paid to everything. So we're planning holidays to the Kruger Park later in the year. Uh, but in the interim, we sit here in the grey, dull British winter. It's not well, much fun, but it's, what can you do? Well, I'll tell you what, stateside here, it's pretty chilly as well. We're not grey. Uh, and I will do this for you. We were back in South Africa uh, Thanksgiving time. And yeah. after the bush a little bit, we were there in the Umphalosi. It was beautiful. Oh, stop uh, it. I'm winding you up. <laughs> and for folks who follow Tony on social media, you'll see more wildlife pictures than you will see golf insights. <laughs> we've got you here for the golf, but... Before we get into it, uh, for folks that haven't heard you on Sky or haven't watched you play back in the day, tell us a little bit about Tony Johnson, how you came up, how you got to where you are. Um, so, sort of took the game up as a fluke, went to um, a little golf resort with my folks when I was 11 years of age. They had a little nine-hole golf course up in the Eastern Highlands in Zimbabwe, which is just stunning. Mm -hmm. um, and the hotel Rhodesia manager said, right. Then, huh? That was Rhodesia. That it was time. Rhodesia in those mm -hmm. days, exactly. Um, and, you know, the hotel manager said, right, everyone in the hotel has got to play nine holes on this little nine hole golf course. Uh, and off we went. And I mean, I sort of had the game drummed into me. On the last hole, I can remember my, my dad hit a, a shot, the only good shot he hit all day. And there was this massive boulder about 20 yards ahead. Uh, very rocky sort of um, uh, scenery and stuff out there. And he absolutely nailed this thing. Hit this rock dead center. We knew nothing about it. And it came straight back at my head. And I went like that. And it just pinned me right on the tip of the elbow. Man, did I cry. An 11-year-old. You would have thought right there. And then I would have thought, hang oh, on. Uh -huh. This is a sign. This is a sign. Stay away from this game. But uh, now we got home. Loved that nine holes. And, and you know, my old man bought a couple of old clubs um, from an auction. And away we went. And just fell in love with the game from that moment on. And still am. I still love the game. I don't love playing the game, actually. Mm -hmm. I gave up. Uh, I stopped playing six years ago after 35 years out on the European Tour and the Seniors Tour. Um, and basically haven't touched a club since. I, you know, I'm not doing a George Foreman. I'm not coming back every couple of years. <laughs> uh, I, I quit with the intention of, uh, of not being driven insane by the game anymore. Love the game. Love competing. Uh, but uh, I never conquered my temper. I had a I had a terrible temper oh. on the golf course, uh, battled it my whole life, came off the course every day, exhausted from fighting my temper, embarrassed about my behavior. And uh, I said to Karen, my wife, 20 years ago, the day I felt I wasn't competitive, um, you know, the, the negative side of it outweighed the pleasure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I called it there, but, you know, still involved with the commentary, still involved talking about the game with guys like you. So I do love the game. I just... I just don't like being an angry man anymore. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, first off, us, us Southern Africans are gluttons for punishment that you get pinned by a golf <laughs> and you come back. Um, but yes, you know, yes, my take for the folks who go check Tony out. He's won 25 times around the world, uh, six times in Europe. You were dominant for a while on the Sunshine Tour down in South Africa. Um, I re the Tony Johnson I remember from when I was just a kid coming up and when I carried on the tour for a while over there, you know, with the likes of the Fulton Alums and you and yeah, yeah. Frost and John Bland, yeah. you know, kind of the heyday, Simon Hobday. Mm. Um, I remember a guy in Tony Johnson who was full of grit, full of determination. And you, and it's a lesson that I want, to, I want you to share with our listeners for them to improve. Temper aside, you, I always believe that if when you signed your scorecard, Tony, it was the mm. lowest score you were ever going to make on that day. You never left stuff out there. And I think that's a skill, and I'd love you to talk about it some. Yeah, I think, I, I think you've, you've nailed it. You know, I think the game brought out the best in me in terms of determination and uh, competitive instinct. Also brought the worst out of me in terms of uh, being a pretty angry man out there. But, yeah, you know, I always, I always went out with the intention of not leaving anything out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I probably did leave a few shots out there when I, when I, I burst a, a fuse, popped a fuse occasionally, and I'd let it carry through to the next shot. But not often. I had the ability to, to go absolutely nuclear. 
Mm-hmm. And then by the next shot, I was settled down and sort of used the anger to motivate myself to, to play better on the next shot most of the time. Um, you know, from a, a guy with sort of, I would say, limited talent, you know, maybe better than average talent. I wasn't a, a Seve or a Nick Price or, you know, Simon Hobday by any manner of means. Um, but I, you know, I always wanted to get the best out of myself. Uh, I probably helped by the fact that when I turned pro, a couple of the, the members at Royal Durban Golf Club, where I was a member, I was at university in Durban at that point, um, sort of laughed at me and said I was going to starve. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing is a great motivator, you yeah. know, and you go out and you think, right, well, I'll show them. And, and basically it's down to self-belief and, and dedication and hard work. And I was, you know, I love practicing. I genuinely love practicing, mm-hmm. which was obviously a huge boon in terms of uh, success out there. You know, well, you know, I'm a golf instructor deep down. I have a microphone in front of my face and, and the recovering college golf coach in me, you know, if I just select a team, um, I would go into hell and battle alongside you because despite the game that you had on the day, I, I knew that Tony Johnson was up for this and the names we're going to talk about, the prices, the Seves, the Montes, these sorts of guys, it didn't matter what the length of their resume was. When you mm. were on the first tee, the times I watched you, I could see it in your comportment and just your eye that you were up for the battle always. Yeah, always. You know, I think it probably comes from, from being a midget. You know, small man syndrome <laughs> probably helped. By the way, before I go any further, I'm glad you said that was a microphone. I thought it was a, just a very serious Tom Selleck moustache that thing in front of you. <laughs> We're on YouTube if you want to watch, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think um, I suppose you would say I was a bit of a confrontational person, fairly aggressive, and I love getting on the first tee. Um, with guys that everybody in the world thought was going to give you a hiding. I love getting on the team with the likes of Ernie, uh, Feldo. You know, my first thought was, right, you giant, I'm going to give you a seat. I'll show you what this is all about, what a, you know, what a, what a, what a, what a midget can do. And, you know, I was very proud of the fact that I had three head-to-heads with Ernie in South Africa, one of them the XO for that happened, and did him all three times. Um, and the, the, the final time, the third time, he looked at me when we walked over and he said, Ah, I don't know what it is, Johnston. I just can't beat you. I mean, that was one of the greatest compliments of my life. It's, it's, um, one, of my, it's one of my crowning achievements. Um, I beat him in a match play game because he's mm. a, he, we're about the same age. I think he might be a little older. Um, mm. We were in the defense force and it was basically the Western province against Northern Transvaal he was playing for at the time. Mm. And uh, I have to be honest, I think he showed up with a little of the after effects of the night before going on. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me <laughs> and, uh, in those days. And I got him two and one. And, and to this day, I will, I'll, I'll, to you, to, to your observation, I'll remember that day. Absolutely. You know, when you, when you came up against um, the stars mm-hmm. and did them, you know, it, it was, there were incidents that you, you never forgot. You know, in the back of your mind, you don't shout about it, but in the back of your mind, you know, oh, I did only three out of three and, you know, yeah. Been felt that the, the PJ at Wentworth, and those are those are just special moments. You know, every win is special, but uh, when you do it against a superstar, obviously it's the the cherry on the cake. So yeah, I, I love competing. I really did. Um, you know, that went back to my my dad, I suppose. You know, when we um, competed when I was a youngster, you know, we'd play darts or anything at home. He would never ever let me win. And my mom, a little Italian about this high, used to say to him, "Oh, shame, man, let him win occasionally." He said, "No." Mm-hmm. No, it's only when you win fair and square that it has any value. Um, and he instilled that in me. So, you know, that sort of instilled a desire to compete and to improve and, and instilled the, the, the joy, the thrill of winning. You know, anytime I ever beat him, I knew he did not let me win. I did it, you know, fair and square. And I think that's a very valuable thing to teach kids. Well, yeah, I think for the parents listening, I think that's tremendous advice because we live in an era nowadays where it's mm. like, Everyone oh. gets a trophy, you know. Oh, the whole, you don't the upset whole, the poor no, child, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, you don't want to hurt him. You don't want to upset him and break his psyche. Rubbish, rubbish. Let the kid realize that when you win, it's something worthwhile doing. Mm-hmm. All right, before we get to legends other than yourself, um, people, <laughs> will, people will talk about Gary Player in biblical terms because of who he was. Yeah. Um, and especially Gary Player out of a bunker. I mean, it's almost the legend of mm. player from the sand has, has grown bigger than what it was. Yeah. 
but I would counter the Tony Johnson out of Greenside Bunker is as good as anyone. Um, so I want you to share the insights with the listeners because so many folks, as we head into a new year of golf, you know, that Greenside sand shot is something that scares the living daylights out of them. So, so what's your take on, on how to get better from the sand? Well, first of all, to go back to Gary, you know, when, when I was a kid, when I was 10, 11 years, 12 years old, um, you know, Gary used to play in the Rhodesian Open as it was. He used to come up and do clinics. And I used to watch this guy from the sand and he would nominate which, which bounce he'd stop the ball on. He'd stop it on first bounce, second bounce, third bounce. Then that would be too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'd get it to run six yeah. feet, 10. Oh, I thought, this is, this is some kind of wizardry, this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he didn't really explain how he did it. He just did it. And I thought, well, you know, I want to be that good or better. And I used to go and just my school holidays, folks would drop you off at seven in the morning before work, pick you up at six in the evening. And I would spend day after day after day wearing out uh, sand dance, um, trying, to, trying to find out how he did this and worked it all out. And, um, you know, it sounds uh, immodest, but I, I genuinely think that I'm as good as anyone that ever lived. I wish I could say that about my putting but I can't, but at the sand, you know, through hard work. Um, and I really studied bunker play and watched the, you know, the good, the great bunker players when I was a kid, um, you know, I led the bunker stats in Europe year after year and, uh, and just loved doing it, but it all went back to Gary. Uh, you will remember being of the same era. Well, not quite, because you're quite a lot younger than I am. You know? <laughs> I'm 51 and fabulous. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, you're, you're just a, a different era. My God, you must've been wearing shorts when I was playing little khaki shorts, but I don't know if you remember those, um, uh, not cartoon book yes, that Gary and, yes, had. The, and they were in the back of the newspaper as well. It Absolutely. Was uh -huh. That was the only coaching we had in Rhodesia then. Every week they had these, um, these little Gary player, um, mm -hmm. Gary player tips, the little drawings. Um, but I think it was his brother, Ian, uh, who he was coaching. Uh, and we used to cut those out. And I used to put them in a scrapbook. And then they came out in booklet form. And I actually found um, a couple of, a few years ago at an antiques fair, the whole set of them. And, and I bought them for my son. He's never looked at them, but you know, you know what son listens to. Hold, hold, hold on one sec. I want, to make sure okay. I, don't knock, I want to make sure I don't knock my coffee over. <laughs> you see, that's the difference. Look. Oh, there it yes. is. For Beautiful. The folks, for the folks on YouTube, it's exactly what oh, Tony Mark, was talking about. Oh, Mark, that is fantastic. That's exactly what I learned. My it it costs 50 man. cents. 100, oh, well done, man. You know, and the difference is when you're 51, you make sure you don't knock your coffee over. When you're 55, you would have knocked that coffee over and ruined that. Thing. I'm just warning you. <laughs> okay, now listen, you're doing like most professional golfers and you're playing it very <laughs> coy with your secrets, okay? So you yeah, know the player never taught you. So what was the what's the keys out of the sand, in your opinion? Keys out of the sand, in my opinion. First of all, uh, just to diverge for a moment, anybody that tells you to stand square on a bunker shot open the club face, swing it a little bit inside, open the chest up three and pat. Do yourself a favor. Put your clubs in your bag, pick up your bag, and run as far away from the guy as you can and delete his number from your phone because you never want to talk to that A lot guy. of modern-day instructors are talking about that right now. I mean, it is absolute, utter nonsense. Okay. You know, the, the, the whole idea with a bunker shop, and you know as well as I do, Mark, that every great bunker player that's ever lived has done the same thing out the sand. Every great bunker player St stood slightly open, mm -hmm. um, opened the club face up to compensate for the fact that you stand, you're aiming left at the target. Yeah. You pick the club up outside the line, you swing it along your toe line, open club face, will square the shot up. It'll come out high and soft with spin. It'll spin a little bit left to right. Uh, pick a spot in the sand behind the ball, address to that spot, not the ball. So don't address the ball and then think, oh, my spot treat that spot in the sand, pick a grain of sand, you know, and it depends how, how uh, confident you get. I always struck the ball probably a quarter of an inch behind the ball. Mm -hmm. um, and people say, well, how do you hit that close to the ball? And it's because I was very steep. If you gave a, a golf club to a child who'd never played golf and said, there's a spot in the sand. I want you to hit that spot every single time. He wouldn't swing the club back and three, pick it up over his head and just do that and hit the same spot all day long. Mm -hmm. So if you want consistency, you've got to hit the same spot every time. And the answer to that is to pick it up quite quickly, quite steeply, and then it's the release of the club head. Stay down over the ball. You release the club head as if it's going past your hands through impact, but down into the ground. 
You've got to trust that the bounce on the soul will stop it from digging. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and a lot of people talk about the amount of bounce that you need on a on a sandwich, blah, 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 blah. The amount of bounce counts. Yes, it does. If you're trying to play with a fairly square face. But if you're opening the club face up, it's the width of the sole that matters. Yeah. Because the back edge of the club drops, the back edge of the sole drops, and depending on how wide the sole is, that's how much bounce you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And you, you can vary that. Um, and once you've, once you've uh, developed um, a sound, straightforward bunker method, then you can do anything. Then you can stand squarer. You can play longer bunker shots. You can spin it more. You can spin it less, a la Gary Player. But if you stand square to a bunker shot and come in very shallow, one of two things is going to happen. If you come in a fraction too shallow, you get way too much sand. Mm -hmm. You duff it and it pops out and runs out. And if you get the right amount of sand, it's going to pop out and still run out. So you, you don't have control of spin. Yeah. Um, and honestly, and, and it's just one dimensional. That's what you've got. And that's all you're ever going to have. Yeah. So, you know, go into YouTube, go and speak to coaches like you who understand about bunker play. Because this whole standing square is, it's coaches. I think it's coaches trying to justify their existence and reinvent the wheel. And what they've come out is not round. It's, mm -hmm. it's a nice, horrible square. Hey, you know, if I think about your remembering your technique out of the sand, you weren't afraid to move up and down the grip handle too, which I think too no. many folks get in there in one place. So, so you were up and down. I mean, I, I'd see you at times, you know, with the fingertips almost on the steel of the shaft on a bunker yeah. shot. And it was a very yep. heavy, fast action as well. There was mm. no lazy out of the greenside sand when you were hitting it. No. And, you know, I haven't mentioned that obviously um, acceleration is the absolute, yeah. it's the absolute um, key to, to bunker play. And the length of your shot should be governed by the length of your backswing so that you're always accelerating. You know, I always felt when I always did, when I finished a bunker shot, I always finished with a full finish, basically. Okay. But that's because I just altered the length of my backswing dependent on the length of the shot. But if you don't decelerate, you're done. You're going to duff it every single time. Um, I think one of, the other, one of the other things I really like doing in, in bunker play, I always played my bunker shots with my feet uh, fairly close together. Okay. Uh, it just makes it much easier to release the club head past your hands and down into the stand. If you stand very wide, you know, it's very hard to release past your hands and your body. So I would say to people, stand fairly with your feet fairly close together, pick a spot in the sand behind the ball and release the club head down into the sand, past your hands, the, club will, the, club, the, the sole of the club will stop it uh, bouncing. And that's a basic fundamental method to at least get it out of the sand if you're a high to middle handicapper. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not that difficult. I think I could take any bunker player, no matter how bad they are out the sand, any golfer, and in a half an hour, I can teach him to get out the sand reasonably. You know, then you want to, you know, obviously when you're out on tour, you're fine tuning it. Your, your livelihood depends on it. You want to be hitting it like this, you know, nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10. Um, and that's just hours and hours and hours of practice. But yeah. uh, now, standing square, no thank you. Well, two observations. I mean, most folks, the club golfers listening to this, don't go and practice bunker play if, mm. if, if there's a, a fall short. And then you speak of the stance width. It never mm. looked to me like you were handcuffed by stance width on any shot anyway. I mean, you were, you, you'd move around narrow, wide and stuff. Yeah. You were hitting yeah. a full iron shot even. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I, you know, it's, I suppose it was down to comfort, stance, lie, that sort of thing. Generally, I tended to be narrower than most. Um, I just found that it, it helped me not move off the ball quite as much on the way back and move through it quite as much on the way through. So, uh, but particularly chipping and sandpaper, I stood with a very narrow stance and it, it just kept me centered and it took so much um, potential disaster out of the equation. Lovely. Right. Um, you mentioned him. He's a contemporary of yours. You guys have played, came up playing a lot of golf, you and, Dennis Watson and mm. uh, Simon Hobday, a whole crowd of you know, Rhodesians, <laughs> yeah. Zimbabweans. Um, Nick Price, I tweeted the other day, some guy put up a picture of his swing sequence and I just retweeted this thing and I said, never no. miss the center of the club face. And you came back and you're like, yeah, it was ridiculous. It Nick was Price, ridiculous. To me is one of the great strikers of all time. Your impressions and maybe what folks can learn from what he did. Uh, you know, I think some guys have just got it. They, 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 they born with a different striking level, a different ability. And my first uh, tournament away from home ever, when I was 12, Nick was 11. 
I was a Bulawayo boy. He was a Harari boy, Salisbury in those days. Mm -hmm. And we used to have these junior tournaments in the different provinces. And I got billeted out to stay with um, Pricey and his mom, Wendy, up in Harare. So, you know, in those days, the folks put you on the train with your golf clubs and your suitcase. Different and they just sent you <laughs> 300 miles away. Off, you know, Cheers, have a nice time. See you in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, I arrived at the, at the station there. Um, as I say, Nick was a, a year younger than me, but he was about... 18 inches taller than me. And apparently, I only learned years later that uh, he'd been sweating blood, thinking, you know, I've got this 12-year-old who's going to come and stay with me, and, you know, I'm going to get bullied. And, and his, the opening <laughs> the opening <laughs> discussion was, he looked at me and said, are you Anthony Johnston? I said, I am. He said, are you really 12 years old? The man was, so what about it? Looking up there somewhere. And, and look, that was the... That was the for posterity's was, sakes, uh, folks, Tony Johnson is uh, all of five foot nine. Uh, you, you, <laughs> no, oh, oh, please. Where do I get those extra inches? Five, seven. I was five, eight, but I've shrunk a bit. But, yeah, well, you and I look each other eye to eye, don't we? I mean, <laughs> well, if I'm on the top step, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, you know, I've never been one of these guys that lies about his height. I, I've always been amused by some of the biographies. We won't mention players in particular that say, uh, you know, that they're five foot six and five foot seven. And I was five, seven, five, eight. And they'd come here, and I'd think, well, tell you what, you must have got left in the dryer too long because you, you shrunk four Wizzy? inches over. You're talking about Ian Wisdom, aren't you? Would I say such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> and Gary. <laughs> All right, back but, to Nick Price, come on. <laughs> back, to, back to Pricey. So, yeah, so I got uh, visited, and that was the start of a lifelong friendship. And we played in a Greensims tournament, a junior event. And, you know, we, we went off to, to the golf club, Warren Hills Golf Club it was, in Salisbury. And, we, you know, we had our little bag of practice balls. And the first shot he hit, I thought, he's only the shot that sounded, sounded like different. that. Mm. I mean, and he stood there at 11 years of age and he just went, <laughs> and I thought, no, I'm glad he's my partner because yeah. he's, gonna be, he's not going to be hitting from the middle of the fairway much, but I am. And it was from the age of 11, I promise you, it was a different sound. And, you know, Nick, uh, when he was younger, he changed his, his method quite a bit with David Ledbetter when he when he went over to the States. But he used to take the club back and then loop it. Very, had a, always had a brisk swing. Almost, swing almost, like loop a Matt, almost like a Matt Wolf, just not as drastic, exactly. but the same shape when he was young. You're right. Exactly. But he, the, the repetition, I mean, he would just hit it at the middle of the club every time. And, you know, even with our little junior clubs, the worn spot in the middle of his irons was that big. You know, my, my club face, the whole face was sandblasted. But he would just... And he would just absolutely nail it. And we went out and, you know, for an 11 year old, he was long, he was incredibly straight. Uh, and that never left him uh, his whole life with, with a driver. Um, and uh, yeah, that was the, the, the opening gambit with Nick. And, you know, I knew straight away, I thought, you know, this guy's in a different league. Does he's, he's a bit younger than us, but he's in a different league. Uh, and you could just, you could tell it. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Historically, look at the look at the results, and he was Mark McNulty was was up there. Unfortunately, Mark never won a, a major, but he won fifty tournaments worldwide. They they were at at two best, and Mark was a course general. Didn't have Nick's striking ability, but maybe one of the most underrated, maybe the greatest putter ever. Oh. Um, I mean, you right. you, you yeah. from an action. I mean, I don't think any guy ever hold more 20, 30, 40 footers in his life than that guy. You just teed me up there, Tony, because I I didn't list Mark in the list of folks yeah, that we're going to talk about. Mm. I asked him one time because he filled it up from all over the place. And I said, oh. tell me about this long putting thing. And he said to me, he goes, you know, I developed a love for making long putts. And he, mm. he said, I'd take my shag bag, you know, your practice bag of balls. He goes, I go get on the green, find the longest putt I could. I'd drop all yeah. the balls out there and 40, mm. 50 feet. I just hit them just trying to make these. And it became a mindset with, McNulty, yeah. he was unreal on the greens. He had, he had some kind of, um, I think he's a bit of a witch doctor in the background. <laughs> you know, we, we, we would stand on pedigrees hitting long putts from 50 feet. We played a lot of World Cups together around the world. We played the Daniel Cups up at St. Andrews. You know, we'd have little putting contests. And when we got on grainy greens in Asia, we'd, we'd have a 50-foot putt. And, we'd, you know, we'd hit it simultaneously. And mine would come out like a scared rabbit, would take off like a rocket, mm -hmm. yeah. get to the hole and put the handbrake on. Marks would trail mine. It, would, it was like he'd miscued it. Mine would, off it would go, and his would come out like this, and I'd think, well, that's not getting it. And somehow, it would keep going at exactly the same speed and stop 
right next to the hole. Mine was a bullet and then handbrake. And I mean, he mystified us. And in South Africa, he would put on uh, bent greens one week that were 11 and a half on the stump. Then we go to Swaziland or Palabora on the edge of the Kruger Park. Greens were eight and unbelievably grainy. You know, we'd have balls bumping and, and it was just that same role. It was, it was astonishing. And you've got to watch McNulty on a, a snooker table or on a piano. He, you know, you just put him down in front of a piano. He hasn't played for 20 years. And he has, he's just got yeah. unbelievable touch and unbelievable eyesight. That's the other thing. Mark has the best eyesight of any human being I've ever come across, which helped him to read slope and uh, a, a miracle worker. I would like to add this because I long maintain and I advise junior golfers. You know, think about how long McNulty used that old golden goose that a cushion. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. But the side of, size of a pinprick. If Absolutely. you want to iron out your putting stroke, you go practice putting with one of those bullseye cushion it's for a while, don't you think? Thank you. One of those or one of the old uh, 8813s or an Arnold yeah. Palmer, an old blade putter. Mm -hmm. But a bullseye, absolutely. You putt with that all day long and you'll soon find out where the sweet spot is. You know, the, the new putters these days, heads this big, massive sweet spot all over the place. Um, I, I mean, I, I suppose I learned from Mark, but I putted for it with a bullseye for most of my life. Um, you know, and you have to concentrate on the sweet spot. And yeah. uh, that's something McNulty did unbelievably well. I would certainly say that. I mean, in, in irons too, you know, getting back mm. to the Nick Price thing, you know, oh, yeah. find yourself yeah. an old iron, you'll learn to hit the center often if you just practice with it. You know, if you just... 100%. When my, when my son was about, I suppose he was about 12, he said, Dad, I, I can, can I get a, another set of golf clubs? I said, absolutely, that's no problem. Um, and I went and got a set of my old Mizuno blades out the loft. Mm -hmm. Got them down. We tinkered with the weights a bit, a bit of a grind, there, a bit of a grind there. And I said, "There we go." And he looked at these things. He went, "Well, what are these?" Because I think he he thought um, Noah had used them to to shepherd the clubs, the, the animals onto the ark. He said, "What right. are these?" I said, "Those are your new clubs." He said, "Oh, yeah, my friends have got Callaways." And yeah. I said, "That's good luck to your friends." I said, "You're going to learn to hit the sweet spot with those clubs. You're going to learn to shape the ball with those clubs, and you'll 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 thank me one day." Oh, and he has. I mean, he, you know, he used those for a couple of years and it taught him the fundamentals of ball striking. Mm -hmm. And he's a good player. He plays off uh, one around Sunningdale. <coughs> Excuse me. Never had any desire to turn pro, but learned to love shaping the ball, which uh, I'm grateful I did that. And he still thinks I'm a miser, but there you go. Uh, you know what? Quickly, just because uh, I'm keeping you for a long time, Grant Waite. No, don't worry about that. Grant Waite, who's a tremendous ball striker, he, mm. to you giving your son the old irons, he learned with a half set of clubs, like there was like a five iron, a seven iron, a nine iron, yeah. blades. Yeah. And he's like, mm -hmm. you learn to play the game, shape mm -hmm. shots, create shots, and hit the ball flush so quickly if you just put in that mindset for a little while. So, right. And now that you mention it, I forgot. I really was cruel. I did give him a half set. <laughs> was, you know, I, I was going to avoid going there. but and, and, you know, he learned to hit you know, soft six irons, mm -hmm. uh, hard seven, hard eight irons. Um, and honestly, it's too easy now to go out, to take your kid to the pro shop, right? Fancy bag, fancy clubs, nice shoes, all of this and all of that. Uh, make them appreciate it. Make them love the game. And that's how you'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little personal story before we move to Seve Ballesteros. My dad, mm. you know, who can, mm. he's mean-ish. Um, <laughs> he had a rule. He's a good dad. He's a good dad. <laughs> He, he had a rule with Trevor and I, when we got into golf, I was 13, Trevor was four at the time. And so as we progressed along, we were only allowed to get white golf shoes when we were low, yeah. legitimately lower than a seven handicap. He goes, Fantastic. you're not wearing white shoes if you're a bad golfer. And I tell you what, to this day, you watch the two of us, we're cleaning on shoes the whole time. Because Absolutely. And, and what, what great motivation that was. You had a goal, didn't you? You yeah. had a goal. Brilliant. I think that's awesome. <laughs> Try to fudge that handicap once or twice, but he, he caught up with me. I, <laughs> yeah, I know you're dead. He's no fool. <laughs> uh -uh. All right. Um, you've had many run-ins with him. Run-ins is a bad word. Con contest with Seve Ballesteros. I mean, legend, mm. Hall of Famer. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about Seve, the shot maker, because you've, oh. I mean, you've, you've seen him play so much. Oh, man. I mean, you know, I had two golfing heroes, Gary Player uh, growing up um, and, and basically throughout my life as well. And Seve, I mean, Seve, you know, was an absolute hero in my mind. And it's a wonderful thing to have been able to play and compete against your heroes. Not many people get to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
But Seve, I genuinely think, was the greatest natural golfing genius that ever lived. I saw him do things with golf clubs that I've never seen any other human being do. I saw him invent shots mid-round that you know he'd never practiced. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, you know, it, it would just come to him. It was a light bulb moment. You think, what the heck is he doing here now? And he'd, he'd pull off a miracle and you'd ask him after the round. He'd say, well, see, how do you do it? Hey, I don't know. I, you know I, I just do it. I just do it. He was just incredible. I mean, around the greens, I was a, a brilliant bunker player. <laughs> without sounding immodest. Um, Seve and I had a lot of, we had a couple of really good competitions together. Uh, and just a very short one in Holland the one year, my first year on tour, he came down to the practice bank. He said, hey, you, you Zimbabwe, you Zimbabwe. I said, yeah, I'm Zimbabwe. He said, hey, here you're good. Are we have competition. I said, yeah, yeah. And I'd been in there for about an hour already. And off we go. We start, you know, my shot, his shot. One up, one down. Well, none that we never, none, neither of us ever got more than one up or one down. Okay. And eventually there's two balls left in the bunker. And now my hands have got blisters. We've been there for hours. We've got a nice little gallery of players and caddies. Mm -hmm. And my turn to go. Hit up. And as I hit it, I think this is just so pure. Ding, ding, ding. Little left to right spin. In. Right. I said, thanks, Sevi. I'm off. Champion. Said, hey, no, no. You wait there. I don't play yet. And he goes up the bunker. And we're same, we go to the same hole for him two hours and he moves the little stones out the way and the grains of sand he comes back if his life had depended on it he couldn't have tried harder i swear i was watching this man's eyes and i thought oh my goodness he's quite serious about this you know as he lost the plot he gets in there and he grinds and he grinds so oh, help me god he hits this thing out it comes and then it's in, in the air i thought oh no ding ding ding, ding. in <laughs> okay now you go home all square and all I mean, it was to have, you couldn't see a man try harder if his kids' lives depended on it. I promise you. Um, and he just he he was he was just wonderful. You know, it was so sad to see him lose his long game. But to the very end of his playing career, Sevi was just startlingly amazing. I couldn't even get the words out. He was just unbelievable. He'd hit it all over the golf course and then still do things. Uh, that you looked at and thought, you know, I could stand and practice that shot for six months and I couldn't pull it off. He was outrageously brilliant. Do you, uh, yes, here's my impression, and I'd love you to, to add to it. Um, I, I think there's a case for Sevi and a case for the listeners where it's about just going to play the game and putting yourself in spots where, you know, mm. you wouldn't want to end and then you figure out how to do it. Because, yeah. you know, as I watched from afar and then I watched from closer when I moved over here mm. he began to work on his golf swing mm. to improve that stuff started to go haywire a little bit so the the golfing the, the golf playing thing kind of went away in the interest of yeah adding up the golf swing and so many folks I find sometimes fall into that trap no question I mean we've how many guys have we seen over the years you know chasing distance trying to change the swing Luke Donald Mark kind of I mean we can we can reel them off Let's not pick names and, you know, just completely lose their game, you know, for a long period. And once you've lost what you had, it's very hard to get it back. Um, and I agree with you, Sevi, although Sevi would, he would ask everybody, he would ask the car cleaner out in the, in the car park, you know, what he should do with his swing. But he didn't necessarily listen. He would give it a bit of a try. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, <laughs> He, I mean, he was always a bit of a sprayer with a driver. We know yeah. that, you know, the, the reverse C and all that sort of thing. But uh, I don't think it, to begin with, I don't think it let him worry him because he knew he could up and down it from the back wall of a cave. doesn't matter where I go, I'm going to make par or birdie. Um, and watching him, watching him, mean, there are very few people I went out to watch on a golf course. And my first year on tour, I went out to watch Seve. And it was just mind-boggling how how good he was around the greens. And it was an inspiration to the likes of me to see this and think, man, you know, I'm not as good a striker as he is. If I'm going to compete and he's got a short game like that, I better start working really hard. Here's a lesson, Tony. And, and I want you, I'm not fishing for backups or anything over here, but hmm. we, we live in the era of strokes gained metrics right now. And, and the strokes yeah. gained off the tee, they've hmm. said that you, if, if you lead strokes gained off the tee, you, you lining up, success which is true i mean if you play from farther down the fairway you're close to the target it helps yeah but i've always maintained 
I'm looking at you and we're talking about Seve and, and stuff and, and maybe even a Nick Price. If Price had hmm. Seve's short game, who knows what he would have done. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and I say that if your short game is sound, it kind of hmm. frees you up with a, with a long game a little bit to be able to swing freer because like you said, Seve could hit it anywhere in the back of his mind. He's like, I know I'm going to make par or something out of this. Absolutely. No, we're on, on exactly the same page, Mark. Look, I mean, the modern equipment, uh, ball and clubs has allowed these guys to hit it so far, yes. And it is a massive advantage. Would you rather be down there 330 in the first cut of rough mm -hmm. or, you know, 280 in the middle of the fairway? There's no, there's no, there's no question. But uh, as you say, strokes gain, there's a flaw in there somewhere because I don't care who you are. If you putt poorly or you have a poor short game, no matter how well you strike it and how often you hit it into 15 feet, you aren't going to win tournaments. You don't putt your best every single week. You win your tournaments when you are putting your best. But that is the, the divider between um, very good players and, and, and brilliant players. And, you know, I've had this discussion with a few guys on tour. I think if you're a fantastic striker of the ball with a mediocre short game, you're going to make a heck of a lot of money. But how many times will you actually win? And, you know, do you want to be a big money earner or do you want to be a, a multiple winner? Mm -hmm. The winners are the guys that have the best short games in a particular week, I believe. Hey, uh, God rest his soul. Uh, Simon Hobday said to mm -hmm. me at one time in his very color colorful vernacular, <laughs> he goes, are you going to have your game four weeks a year? You better win no. those weeks, huh? There you go. And the Hobday, yeah. I mean, one of the greatest strikers of all time in the same league as Nick Price, Tom Watson, Hogan, um, was a terrible putter. But when you got to tournaments where the greens were poor, you used to go, right, boys, who's playing for second <laughs> this week? Leveled. Because you're all going to putt rubbish this week. <laughs> no, he was, he, was a, he was a legend, obviously. An absolute legend. Yeah, speaking of legends, uh, you talked about him. Um, I've skipped over a few years because of time. Um, Nick Felder. Um, mm. what's your take? What can folks learn from watching what Felder did throughout his career? Uh, I mean, Felder was one of the, the course generals, mm -hmm. you know, he, he never tried to do something that he, he wasn't capable of doing. Didn't never really took great yeah, risks, man. but he was so incredibly consistent in every department. You know, for, for a big guy, I mean, Felder's, um, it's huge. Yeah, it's massive. I mean, six feet, four, six feet. Now, when you stand next to Feldo, when you haven't seen him for a while, you think, my God, you're a giant. Mm -hmm. um, but he never chased distance. Uh, and he worked on technique. He worked on course management. And his goal was to make scores, not to impress with distance or anything else. Um, and he was just absolutely, utterly focused on, on, mm -hmm. on golf. You know, people saw him as unfriendly or, you know, unsociable. Maybe they were right. But when Feldo got into playing mode, you know, you could walk past him in the, in the passage from the locker room and say, morning, Nick. And, you know, we used, it used to irritate us, but I don't think he actually heard us. He was just so utterly obsessed and focused on going out to go and shoot 65. I just don't think he heard us. I really don't. He was just unbelievable. I work on a broadcast crew with him right now, and I'll tell you what, to this mm. day, he's so professional about what he does that yeah. before a show or whatever, you yeah. sometimes say something and he's, it's not like he's blanking you, but he's just so into, and he's so singular yeah. about what he's about to do. Yeah. It was absolutely a strength of his and, and just nothing got in his way. You know, Felder said his, his sights on, uh, you know, taking out normal at the masters. Mm -hmm. That's what he set out to do. And I mean, hard, hard man to beat, hard man, fabulous golfer. All right. Speaking of hard men to beat, uh, Bernard Langer. <laughs> I, I, I see you laugh, but, but, but this guy, he's found the fountain of youth. I mean, oh. <laughs> screw Ponce de Leon, Bernard Langer, oh. whatever he's doing, he's, he's worked it out. But, but throughout his career, this is a guy who turned pro at 14, who yeah. coming up hard, but oh. now is a Hall of Fame legend. What's the lesson? If Langer had been a boxer, I would not have gone in the ring with him because the only way you would beat him is if you actually killed him. Because he would just keep getting up. No matter what you did to him, he would never, ever, ever give up. You know, you'd have to tie him up and rope. I mean, just, he, he's a phenomenon, isn't he? You know, I played with, uh, with Bernard in the early 80s at Sunnydale in the European Open. Mm -hmm. uh, played with him and um, Ewan Murray, who you know, people around the world will, will know from broadcasting as well. Mm -hmm. And after four holes, we couldn't watch him. You've never seen anybody 
with hips like that. It, I mean, it was the purest exhibition of striking, but it was every patty head. It was like he was holding a cobra by the tail. It was, it was the scariest thing I've ever seen. Right. Um, and you and I both plunked it around, I think for 69s or something. Bernard hit uh, every par five in two. He hit three of the par fours in one. And he never hit it outside 15 feet all day. And I think he shot 76 or 77. Wow. It was heartbreaking. And he overcame that a few times. The strength of will. Times. I mean, speak to speak to beating the yips, not once. I think he oh. did it three times, if not more. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. And, you know, you can't say that the yips is entirely mental because it must be a physical thing in his, in his, um, in his case. Because he's got a mind like a steel trap. I mean, I love playing practice rounds with Bernie. You know, we played quite a few over the years played a few seniors open practice rounds with him and the focus, the determination. I mean, it is, a, it's unbelievable. And he's still as thirsty for wins now as he was when he was 15. I mean, you know, he's a legend. He, he's a one-off, you know, at some point you think, you know, you get a little bit tired of this, not Bernard. He just wants to win. He just loves when he loves competing and what a gentleman as well. What an, absolute gent i've you know i've got as much time for bernard as langer for bernard langer as i could have for anybody a, a really truly great human being i got one lesson from langer i wish i spent more time with him and he mm. said something to the effect of folks get this he goes i'd rather be a hundred percent committed with a wrong club in my hand than have the mm. right club in my hand and be wishy-washy and 50 50 <laughs> how's, how's that for mindfulness too Exactly, and that, that sums him up, doesn't, doesn't it? Have you ever seen Langer hit a, a sort of wishy-washy, wafty swing? Now, if it goes offline, it goes offline. It's mechanical failure, but man alive. Um, just a phenomenon. There's no other way to describe it. I mean, the guy's a ledge. All right, we, we started this podcast with the, the South Af some of the South African greats, and we, you've talked about Gary. You know, we, we've talked about yourself and Nick Price and spoke briefly about hob day but there were so many good ones um mm. uh, I was john bland say, uh, yeah blandy I was speaking of hitting an iron mm. flush <laughs> good, good oh. golly um but you told me a story before we went live and i've got to share this um bobby lock <laughs> i had one brief yeah. putting lesson with him i mean the thing that the lesson was like 10 minutes and yeah. uh he you speak of balls with mcnulty rolling along the green mm. when bobby lock hit the thing it would roll over peanut brittle like it was rolling on glass Unbelievable. And, and and he sort of spoke about drawing putts a little bit, which was fascinating. Yeah. You, you speak of drawing. Now, you, mm. I, I want to talk about hitting just one shot and just mastering one shot because mm. nowadays so many golfers are like, well, got to be like Woods. I got to hit the nine shots. We love yeah. went into the Hall of mm. Fame just hitting one thing on every single shot, including his putts. Exactly. And I mean, you know, they say he played with, with a draw. It wasn't a draw. It was a hook. And the only time I ever got to watch uh, Bobby was at uh, Royal Durban Golf Club, which is uh, built inside a, a race course, a yeah. horse racing racetrack. Um, and he was there just pitched up there. I don't know if it was a corporate day. I can't remember a long time ago. And I thought, this is Bobby Locke. I'm going to go and watch him a bit. Mm -hmm. And he got up on the first hole and um, quite a and narrow field. The right. <laughs> you've got sort of 15 yards of rough and then an out-of-bounds fence, uh, which is the race course. And he hit this thing and it took off so far right. I thought, oh my God, where's that guy? And it, it took off over the out of bounds fence, went 150 yards, and then just had this big looping hook, absolutely dead center of the fairway. Oh, okay. Iron shot for probably about a six iron in those days, took off right to the greenside bunker, big looping hook, 15 feet. And then that, that very wristy, unique yeah. stroke of his. And his head used to move all over the place when he putted. You know, we tell people keep the head still. I mean, it was a massive movement of the head with this big rolling right hand over the left hand. And, and she went for three. I watched three or four holes and he just, just kept hitting it over the out-of-bounds fences on, and, this, and just rolled them. And as you say, could roll it over peanut brick. I mean, Dennis Hutchinson, who all the, the viewers will know if they watch a lot of golf, he always ranked. Bobby Locke is the greatest putter of all time. And Hachi could put the eyes out of it. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest short games you've ever seen. So, yeah, unbelievable, Bobby Locke. Hey, I'd love your take. Now, a lot of golfers, club golfers listening to this likely hit a slice, and they don't want to master mm. one shot because the slice is weak. Mm. Mm. But speak to the merits of 
just having one shot that you know that you can kind of go to the bank on because mm. when it comes right down to it. There's no doubt, I guess, if you're standing over the golf ball and knowing that this thing's going to do X. 100%. And I think particularly under the cost, I think there's too many youngsters out there now that, that don't have a bread and butter shot mm. when they get them into contention, you know, where you know you can just get it in off the back, you know, slightly back in the stance with the driver and hit a low squeezy fade. Uh, that'll just keep you out of any kind of trouble. You know, these guys get up now, they pound it, they hit it, and often they don't really know where it's going. And I'd say, yes, have, have, have a shot, a favoured shot. If you're a natural-born fader, you can spend the rest of your life trying to draw the ball and gain extra distance. You're going to struggle for a long, long time. If you're a fader of the ball, accept it. If you're a drawer of the ball, accept it. By the way, Bobby Locke... Uh, <laughs> You know, they, they try to stymie him on, on the US tour, on the PGA tour, because he hit everything with that big high draw. And the one, the one tournament he went at, they put all the flags front right. They thought, well, we've got him here. And apparently, I don't know how true it is, he went out and hit everything with a high soft fade, beat them by about 11 shots. Oh, no. So they just, just ban him because they knew they couldn't beat him. But, you know, I'm, I'm with you, Mark. Have a, have a bread and butter shot. If you're a fader of the ball, yes, be able to hit draws if you need to. And I was always a fader of the ball and I would stand on the range and hit fades. And then every fourth or fifth shot, I'd try and hit a little draw just to make sure that it was still in the bag there oh, somewhere. But, uh, you know, I sacrificed distance because of it, but I never felt happy with a, with a draw on the hook. So do what comes naturally. Do what, what's going to put the lowest score on the board. That's, that's what the game's all about. Preach, my friend. Okay. Um, <laughs> for a long time. Um, That's a pleasure. There's a story. I've got to have you share this. And it's urban legend right now. And it's grown legs, I'm sure. Uh, but I need to hear this one from the horse's mouth. Um, and it's an anecdote, a little uh, a little uh, tete-a-tete that you had with Seve Ballesteros one time, where you were playing alongside <laughs> each other. And he was sort of trying to just massage the rules a little bit. I think you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. The sprinkler. Uh, yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> please share the story for the viewers and listeners. We were playing together in in Holland in the Dutch Open. Um, we're on a little par four, sharp right angle dog leg, with a, a tree right, a lone tree right on the corner of the fairway. Um, and it's a, it's a slightly blind tee shot. You can see the top of the tree, but not the landing area. And we'd both hit it slightly right of where we wanted. Um, and off we went. And I was always a, I was always a runner. I mean, I was fast pretty walker. slow over the ball, but I was a fast walker. I got there, gave me more time. So I get down there and there's one ball that is absolutely stone dead, right up against it. I mean, it's like this up against the tree. And there's another one 15 yards past, um, lying in the middle of the fairway. Ah. So Sevi comes wandering up. Um, and I thought, well, oh, this is this is too good an opportunity to miss. So yours, yours, it was a, yours is in the fairway, just for so far. Well, I'm not telling you that. Yet, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this ball is stone dead against the tree, and there's a sprinkler, but it's I mean, it's about four or five feet away. Mm -hmm. So Sevi comes over the hill and I put my club down behind the ball and I stretch my leg out as far as I can and I can just touch the sprinkler. I said, Sevi, uh, I've got a sprinkler idea. I'll get a drop. He says, hey, no, no, no. Natural stance only. I said, well, what about this? So I, I make as if I'm going to chip out sideways to the left and I stretch out my left foot and I can just touch the sprinkler. I said, well, what about this, Sevi? This is interfering with my stance. He says, yeah, no, 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 no. He says, you know, I know the rule. The rule is natural stance only. I said, mm, you're right, Sylvia, and I know the rules too. Natural stance only, and that's your <laughs> ball. Go. That's mine in the fairway. <laughs> and he goes, ah, hey, yeah, you, you think you're funny. You think you're funny, eh? But, you know, <laughs> it was such a good story. We never get around to the, the end of it. He chips it. He says, okay, I'll chip it out sideways. He chips it out sideways, knocks it onto about 30 feet. I wedge it into 25 feet. We get up to the green, and I mean, you know, you, God couldn't write the script. You know. He rolls it in for four by three putt for five. Oh, no, I didn't know that. I mean, you know, you just, and um, so he doesn't swear often. He didn't swear often, but as he walks past me off the green, I won't use the exact word, but he goes, hmm, see what happened when you mess with Sevy, eh? And <laughs> off he went. And everybody just cracks up laughing. And, oh, oh, oh. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, he was a he was he was a gent. He was a gent. Uh, so appreciate you joining us. Okay, so if the folks want to see pictures of wildlife, uh, what's the social media <laughs> handle, please? Uh, Twitter Tony Johnston fifty six. Love the wildlife. You'll see more wildlife than golf, as you said, but uh, a bit of both. Yeah, love it.
and they can uh, you're part of the sky crew announcing european tour golf if folks want to listen to you yes yeah, sky crew and i do the world feed as well um i i work both teams uh, the international feed and sky so you'll you'll you know you'll you work out what the mute button is for if if i irritate you but uh i love it i love doing the commentary love being involved and and just love uh, talking golf yeah, you like what we have done today with you. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite experience. listens. I wake up early in the states with a coffee and I switch on the European tour and listen to you and you and and and, and all these great voices. In the oh, world. thank you, man. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us and thanks for all the insights. They really appreciate it.